did the Philippines make me an entrepreneur? Um, I'll be honest with you, the answer is no. Um, I don't know, if, it depends how far back you go. Um, if you go back to when I used to do carpentry and build flat pack houses, I used to keep socks and jeans. I used to buy a uh, bulk load of second hand jeans for £1.25 each and I'll sell them for £5 a pair. Being in a building with 60 plus carpenters, we snag our legs on nails all the time. As such, market for jeans. When it rains, your feet get wet. Sell socks. I was doing that even though back then I was earning after tax one and a half thousand pounds a week take home, which is a lot more than the average person earns in the UK anyway. But I still did it. It's just one of those things that it's in my, you know, like when they say it's in in his water or whatever. <laughs> it's like that. It's just what I do. Now I roll back to many moons ago. Um, my ex's brother had a bed shop. He didn't run it very well. Didn't make any money. So basically, he decided to pull in, pull out the business. And my ex mentioned he was giving it up, etc. And I said, you know what? How much does he want for it? And he he just wanted the stock price and what was left on the rent. So it was four hundred and fifty pounds. Not a lot of money, is it? But what I did is I could see going to the wholesalers cost me ten pounds. So what do you do? Ten pound delivery. So we started off, we got £450 worth of stock in the shop. Somebody come in, I'd sell the bed off the floor and go and get another one, put it there. And then with the profit, buy another one. And I built it up. The first week, uh, we'd gone up to, from that £450 worth of stock to £2,500 worth of stock. And it continually grew. I started off with, I think I had an old Renault traffic van uh, that I was using for carpentry work. Um, Cause I used to be a cabinet maker. You know, I said it, I did the flat pack housing. After the flat pack housing, cause it, that company was actually sold to its competitor. Um, I was doing flat pack house, uh, cabinet making, making pine furniture, that sort of stuff. So I had my little Renault traffic van, not the best van, old tatty, but it's a builder's van. So we used that. Within six weeks, I had bought my first Mercedes van. And shortly after that, I bought another Mercedes van because I was running up to the wholesalers and back. And then we were doing the deliveries. The problem I had is we had one unit in one town and another two units in another town because uh, we had expanded. And this unit that we started from uh, we're having problems changing the plan permission regs on it. So running backwards and forwards. But then somebody called us up and says, uh, we've come across your business. Who does your deliveries? So we said, well, we do it ourselves. Well, how, you know, would you do ours for us as well? Then I moved from doing, well, I say moved, still had the furniture shop, but then I started doing the deliveries for another company that was far more successful than us and far bigger. So that's the thing, I don't mind when somebody does really well, I don't go, oh well, it's because of this. I'm happy for them. But I also profited from it. Because what happens, I'm doing their deliveries and we're doing a good job, so they wanna make sure we're paid well. So I was making another three and a half thousand pounds a week from delivering their goods because all heavy Indian furniture. I was then making money off the shops because my brothers were then working at the shops for us and then I would run around, do all the deliveries, pick up, go to wholesalers and it just kept growing and growing. Um, and then the furniture, I would like start off with the wholesalers, then I was going into Wales to get other stock because I found out where some of these places do um, they're probably not there. It's the old MFI crap. You know, the cheap furniture. Overpriced cheap furniture. Overpriced, cheaply made. Uh, I can remember my dad still got it now. There's a TV unit in the house because he bought the wall unit and it was quite expensive. And, he, and I said, I'll, I can get you the uh, the side unit for that. My dad's like, no, you can't get that. 
it's very expensive 800 pound it is in the shop 800 pounds so um, on my next trip I went and got him one and it cost me 35 um, but the point being is I was churning all the time making money left right and center never say no to an opportunity see somebody put that on um, Bridget, the guy Richard Branson so you know we see him on Facebook and stuff where they go oh Einstein said so this is what I'm saying I don't know if Richard Branson said this or not but the fact was he was saying never refuse an opportunity you can learn it afterwards sort of thing I would say that yes unless it's actually something like rocket science or something um, in this case we were doing the deliveries for somebody else because when we did the deliveries uh, because we're because we're a contractor we're paid to go out and do the delivery so when they say go to Grimsby I go to Grimsby on the way back it's up to me where I stop or not it's my vehicle so on the way back we load up with other furniture from other places and take back to my units because they are paying for the delivery the vehicles mine petrols mine etc that's how you can expand things out quite quickly and actually very profitable. Um, is it easy? No, 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 no. My average day then was 18 hours a day, seven days a week. Because at weekends you have an upsurge, not a downsurge. <laughs> Everybody is coming in because they know that they all come to my place because it's cheap. Not cheap quality, just cheap because like sofas I used to buy some, see this is what happens I end up doing one thing and end up doing another because I see the opportunity there's um there's a furniture place that does all these sofas for big catalog companies Argos and Kay's catalog and all those um, when they get returns they go back to their warehouse for destruction they basically will put Stanley knife through the backs and stuff and throw them in the skip because they're insured you see but if you go there with money, um, you can. It's all received. It's it's legal. You can buy the damaged stock as damaged stock. Now, if you imagine a sofa costs a thousand pounds, and I pay somewhere between sixty and one hundred and twenty pounds for every sofa I buy, you can see there's a bit of a margin in there. There's problems with them. Firstly, you get uh, the dusty. Next it could have the springs that fell out inside the thing you could get a duff one which is you know it's brand new but the quality is not great but the fact is brand new they are a thousand pounds each the cheapest ones are about 600 pounds and I'm paying for a cheap one 60 70 pounds so what happens I take it in I bought a steam press I steam clean them so they look brand spanking new if, a, if it springs have fell out, I flip it onto its back, take all the lower covering off, I then weave all the springs back in, and then I add these extra bits to actually tension the springs, better than they actually manufacture them. Because if you actually see one upside down, they just put, the, the springs are like, you've got a sort of L shape like that, and then they weave down, then another L shape. What I do is I tension them on the other side, and they pull so they can't fall out anymore these sofas I would put in for uh, let's say 450 to 650 pounds a piece sold as seen shop soiled shop returns whatever you want to call it and people will come in now the thing is the profit margins there so when somebody goes okay it's 650 pounds and they're like, I like it, I like it. I don't have 650 pounds. Um, I really do like it though. And I said, well, what, what have you got? Well, don't know, don't know. I says, well, I'll tell you what, I'll do it for 500 pounds and I'll deliver it, deliver it now. You can take it home with it. Really? Yeah, bang, sale, gone. Beds with mattresses. I had solid oak, uh, not, they're, um, the Brazilian, Brazilian pine, I think they were or something, but they were, the headboard's seven foot high, turnings like this, huge beds. The, the beds are over a thousand pounds each. I, I was paying three hundred and fifty and knocking them out for 
I think those were £600 including the mattress. A mattress, big thick mattress that would normally cost £300 on its own, I pay 70 quid for. The point is, I look for these opportunities and I make money on them. But also people then bring stuff to you. You know, last week I was on about the dog food. I bet some people think, Matt's bloody mad. Dog food? Who, who buys pallets of bloody dog food? Pet shops do. Um, markets. You know what I say, I've got a market behind me? They will buy dog food. I just find one trader that wants it and I'll only supply to him for this market. Deal done. That's how I work. Now this isn't me intimidating everybody and saying look I'm good you're bad. I'm telling you you've got opportunities around you all the time. Van Gogh, a close friend of mine, um, he now lives in Cheltenham. Cheltenham's a very wealthy area full of people that don't have time for cleaning and stuff or even hairdressers and, certain, and stuff like that which gets on to another person in another town. Henley and Arden, very wealthy place. Uh, the hairdressers is open till about 10 11 o'clock at night and the person who owns it makes a fortune but Van Gogh um, was talking to his wife his wife's actually a pharmacist she's Polish but she it's not recognized in the UK but it's good for the rest of Europe uh, but anyway that's not a knock at her so it's a, a knock at the madness of the UK thinking it's superior to the rest of the world but the the fact was they started off right we'll do cleaning then so we started off with one customer like a couple of times a week a couple of hours then two and now I think it's 12 customers and it's growing now the advantage they've got is their bills are already paid now because this is like me you know when I told the company I work for to go and get stuffed the um, they were like people don't say that people can't say that about us you know that's not that's not how we deal with it well it's how you treat people so I just treat you the way you treat treat, mis, treat me so I'm just giving you the same respect but the point being they're in a, the uh, scenario now financially they own enough where they don't need to do anything else they're no longer reliant on anybody else which opens up the next set of doors do they increase the cleaning business or do they say you know what that's enough cleaning for now We'll do something else as well. We'll do, we're, like, we're busy with the cleaning, but maybe I want to do something else that's a bit more interesting. You know, maybe finish doing the pharmacy paperwork so you can do it in the UK, um, or maybe do another training course or become a taxi driver in the evenings or something. Whatever they want to do, because this is one of the key elements here is creating your own space because most of the things that people don't talk about is driving for freedom driving for what makes you happy you look at marketeers online they just talk money 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 the money I make the money I make money is irrelevant money means nothing you can't take it with you when you're in that ground you're gone the only thing you can take with you is your memories until they fade away into the uh, the worms um, bellies but the the fact is you've only got one life if you don't live it now you never will so look at what you want to do look at what you've got around you, you you'll see stuff all around you that nobody's touching nobody wants to be a cleaner why did I become an engineer because nobody wanted to do it nobody wants dirty hands I want to work in the office I want to be an IT guy I want to be an IT guy Oh look, they've given all those jobs to the Indians and everybody else overseas. Um, what can I do now? Well, I wish I'd trained as an engineer now. The fact is, there's always opportunity. It all depends on how you work it. Like I said, cleaning is not the perfect job. Well, for some people it is, but at the same time, not hard to find clients either. Look at what you want to achieve. Because it's a bit like here in Spain. I sit here, you look at what the tourists have in the town and you think, what haven't they got? So you analyse what other places have got. One of the things I do quite regularly, if I see a dot com or something on a car, 
I'll actually look it up because I'm looking at what they're doing because it's much easier to take a working business model than start a new one so if you can see that uh, Joe's chicken shack works well in the next town and you haven't got one maybe you're missing an opportunity there anyway thanks for watching